faucet. Thank you, Scott. I should have had my topic on stress management tonight, but it's not. It's maybe a, a similar one that equally applicable. It's, I want to talk about sensation seeking. You know, I think we as um, with a lot of the intensity addictions we see with sex addiction or porn addiction, it's all about sensation seeking. And I think we don't really talk about it enough. So I want to just define what it is first. And that is really this tendency to seek out varied, complex, novel, but mostly, most of all, intense experiences. And it, it's really been recognized as a, a general personality trait that people have had for a long time. Starting in the 60s, they started to notice it. And it's really conceptualized as having four distinct areas of sensation seeking that people look for. One is um, experience seeking, the other is thrill seeking, adventure seeking, that kind of thing. Um, but then there's two other characteristics that I think are so relevant to sex addicts. And obviously I didn't say this in the beginning, but sex and porn addicts um, are very much sensation seekers, right? So there's the experience seeking, the thrill and adventure seeking. Then there's also this characteristic of disinhibition and, and boredom susceptibility or boredom intolerance. So people that need the stimulation, need the sensation, need the intensity. Um, and when it happens, they start to get disinhibited and their, their fear of being bored goes away and they get a whole big dopamine kick. And so this seems to be kind of the way some people are hardwired, but we see this kind of a, a setting the stage for different kinds of intensity addictions. Um, and so there's been a lot of research on actually the brains of intensity seekers and what happens. And they're different than the brains of, I guess, we call normal people. Um, but in people that are sensation seekers, um, the brain actually releases more dopamine and less norepinephrine. This, this is actually true of everybody. If we're, if we're getting intensity, we get a lot of dopamine. Any addict can speak to that. And less norepinephrine and high sensation seekers. But this is, this is more exaggerated in sensation seekers. So what I'm saying here is the brain is actually a little bit different in the chemical response to different experiences. And people that tend to be sens sensation seekers tend to seek it out um, for the thrill of it, for the dopamine, for that new exciting adventure, um, and, and the minimal stress that, that occurs when they do it. They actually kind of get out of the stress zone. They, they actually describe when they get in the most intense, uh, for example, there, there are studies of these people that do high risk skiing, you know, down really like ridiculous slopes and stuff. And, and they're, they're definitely sensation seekers, but when they're in the midst of that activity, they all describe a calmness. So it's like somehow it's a sense of being in control of this wildly kind of escalating intense situation, but they actually fall into a calm state as opposed to being more excited like or fearful like a normal person would. So basically there's some genetic factors involved, there's some learning factors, and all this came out uh, in what's now called the type T personality for thrill. And um, this doesn't have anything to do with the uh, Myers-Briggs letters, but it's it's T for thrill and has both good and bad aspects, right? It can foster creativity, but it can also foster crime. It can foster adventurousness, but it can also create violence. Um, it can encourage courage, um, but it can also lead to drunk driving. So it, it has a really a, a double-sided Thing. We know that, that thrill-seeking young adults, this type T young adults, are twice as likely to be involved in highway accidents, for example. So there's a carelessness, there's sensation-seeking, and then when the prefrontal cortex, which is the adult in the room, kind of goes offline, then, then that behavior becomes even more um, destructive. And so uh, people drink more, experiment more with drugs, experiment more with everything. Um, they're really, sensation-seekers are really the great, the great experimenters of, of life, I guess you could call them. Um, and what's interesting, we talk about sports like mountain climbers, uh, bungee jumpers, but especially like mountain climbers where you say, well, why did you climb it? Why did you climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. Um, if you talk to a sensation seeker, it's not because it's there, it's because it offered a stimulation and challenge, right? So it's, it's all about the challenge and the stimulation involved with sensa sensation seekers. Um, so this is really interesting. There's not a whole lot of literature, but there is a couple of studies looking at sex addicts and sensation seeking. And in 2015, there was a study that studied sensation seeking and, and by looking at actually biochemical responses, hormones and brain chemicals um, of different kinds of addicts, sex addicts, stimulant, amphetamine addicts, opioid addicts, and just normal folks, the controls and the experiment. 
by far the most sensation seeking group was sex addicts, even more than the amphetamine addicts, more than the meth and cocaine people. They, the sex addicts were like off the charts in terms of um, that sensation seeking behavior and the resulting chemicals. So uh, it's just really interesting to, to see that in many ways people are wired for this. We often have a question in recovery, so what do I do? And I think it's hard to fight the way we're wired sometimes. Um, if somebody is a sensation seeker, I think to sort of say, okay, well, I'm never gonna seek sensation again is just not realistic. But I think we have to figure out how to do it, how to engage in that and, and uh, get the sensation, get the intensity, but in a healthy way. And so we've talked before about clients I've had who, for example, were one was a looked to parachute. But so instead of just parachuting by himself with a group of strangers, I encourage him to go with a group of other recovery people, right? So he, he was able to get his um, intensity experience, but in a, in a great way that actually fostered his recovery. So I think it, we can't just ignore the need for sensation and intensity and excitement, but we have to really be careful of it if you're a sex addict because you're kind of hardwired to go all the way in on that. And it's a really dangerous situation. So I think we just have to really try to make it a recovery activity and just be aware of that need for escalation. Many people describe it as a biological need if you're wired that way, but also be aware of the, the need for escalation when that happens. So um, the other thing I just wanna mention about sensation seeking, sometimes if people have trauma, they uh, we see that there's evidence of a lot of sensation seeking as part of their trauma experience. And we know, for example, that meth users that have trauma um, will start seeking sensation and actually get into PTSD. So these, these things are all kind of wired and connected together and just as a matter of extremes. But I just kind of want to talk a little bit about tonight about sensation seeking. And I have my own bit of intensity trying to log on tonight. So one that I'll just as soon not repeat in the future. So yeah. I, I guess <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, David. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, the neurotransmitters like um, dopamine and norepinephrine, which I'm still learning to pronounce. Can you tell us what the difference is just between those two, since they, they are so important in terms of sensation seeking? Right. So dopamine, really, as we know, is all about uh, giving reward, giving that pleasurable feeling. Um, norepinephrine is more of a call up calming kind of thing. Uh, that's kind of the opposite, the antidote almost that um, is, is more of a, a I, I call it a kind of a sh shutting down neurotransmitter as opposed to an escalating one. Um, and then serotonin, of course, which is involved and in also in mood sensation, mood control. And all these, by the way, are people who are no doubt familiar when we talk about antidepressant drugs. These are the neurotransmitters that they're tinkering with to, to help our mood. So the, it's, it's about balance between all these um, and, and finding the, the proper balance in them. But they all have very distinct characteristics and functions really in the brain. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, it's um, sex addicts, um, we tend to get stuck in the dopamine adrenaline rush and we forget about other neurochemicals that are equally pleasurable, but very different like serotonin and oxytocin. Well, serotonin is very kind of, can be very touchy-feely and, and more, much more pleasant actually than the intensity of dopamine sometimes. Yeah. Again, we need a moment of balance. Yeah, so, okay, let's let's jump into the Q&A uh, here. We've got a bunch of them already. Um, hello, hello, Dr. Fawcett. Can you see these, David, or? Uh, no, I can't, so I'll listen. I'm, I'm going to try one more time to make you a co-host and see if this will do it or not. Yeah. Um, it looks like, nope, maybe, nope. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Okay, this is where we are. I'll read them, and I'll read them slowly for you. Um, okay. Hello, hello, Dr. Fawcett. Um, how long does it take for a porn addict to reset dopamine levels um, so that uh, a partner can be uh, sexually exciting. Um, are there tools and medication to speed up this process? Great question. Yeah, it's a really great question. We we're just speaking about this with the clients today. Um, so with sex and porn addiction, there is a little bit of damage to the brain that happens called uh, dopamine downregulation. It's not really damage. It's your brain adjusting to all the intensity of acting out. And so when there's that much dopamine floating around your brain as a result of the sexual and porn acting out, your brain uh, has one move to try to adjust to it. 
And that move is to start to kill off its own dopamine receptors so it doesn't have as much dopamine kind of flowing around the system. So when we get into recovery, our brain is actually adapted to the intensity of our acting out. So when we stop acting out, there's a period of adjustment back, as this question indicates. And that, that, that adjustment back is the brain having to develop, actually really recreate, regenerate new dopamine receptors so that the dopamine can flow more properly. Um, this is a relatively newly discovered process. It's, it's most extreme in meth addicts, where, where it takes up to 24 months. Sex and porn addicts don't take nearly as long, um, and it's not as well measured. It takes a lot of uh, PET scans and fMRI scans and stuff to determine this. What we know basically from anecdotal experience, from observation, and some research is that it can take usually typically three to four months for the dopamine to kind of get back to normal, the brain to kind of readjust, and uh, so for the wiring basically to be back in place. There's a couple technicalities on that. The, the older you are, the longer it takes for the brain to regenerate those dopamine receptors. Uh, the younger, the, it's faster. Not everybody has the same amount of damage uh, or adjustment. So you may find some individual differences. Uh, some people don't feel anything. They, they're, they're right in there from the get-go. Other people really experience um, one of the forms this damage takes is anhedonia. That we've talked about that before, that it's an inability to experience pleasure. Literally, the things that used to give you pleasure, like good food or your spouse or your dog or your favorite music or whatever, um, none of it generates the amount of dopamine necessary to make it a, a pleasurable experience. So there's gonna, so the first couple of months may be kind of blah and gray. And I've had people describe it as kind of having a gray film over their their face where they're kind of looking out at just blah, nothing. Also, we can be highly impulsive and, and a little bit hopeless during this period. And that's a bad combination for an addict, right? To feel like, what's the point? This isn't gonna get any better anyway. This is how it is. So we can talk ourselves into trouble. So to answer your question more specifically, I think um, three to four months is the time frame. There's really nothing we can do to speed it up. There's a lot of research right now into different kinds of infusions and chem biochemicals and stuff that, that could help that speed up. The one thing we know that does help, the only thing we know that helps is exercise. And exercise works by throwing off amino acids, these proteins that are the, the building blocks of these receptor sites. And so that can help regenerate and speed up the process some, but I always say beware of exercise too, because that can become an addictive behavior that people start overdoing. And yeah. And this happens with all addictions. It's not just uh, amphetamines and, and porn. Um, the brain recognizes there's too much dopamine floating around. It basically has a dimmer switch and it just turns, it dims the dopamine. Um, just it, it reduces the amount of electricity to a light. It's it's a dimmer switch and it takes it a while to recognize, oh, now I'm too low and it it turns up and lets a little bit more out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's sort of the easy metaphor. Um, okay, it's been four months since the discovery of my porn addiction. Um, I have been sober since then, but my wife doesn't believe me or feel safe. Um, although I'm doing uh, sex addict groups, 12-step groups, uh, reading books, journaling, looking at family of origin, I have tracking software, etc. <clears throat> she continues to say I'm doing nothing and not changing. Um, she is angry and verbally abusive and feels I should suffer because of what I've done to her. I know this is from hurt. Um, how do I respond for to her anger i am out of the and then it cuts off so so how do i respond to her anger so this is somebody four months sober from porn addiction um is doing quite a bit of work but the wife has not come around yet right and this is not an unusual scenario there of course um and what what you're seeing is the spouse still um in that reactive mode, you know, the, the betrayal trauma, that's a very real thing and a very strong thing and takes a while to work out, right? Uh, and I think I would just ask, make sure your wife has adequate support, a, a support group, a, a, a CSAT therapist to talk about this because this is not something we can kind of work through on our, so on our own. We need that um, kind of guided um, support of a therapist. We need the, the mutual support of, of peers to help us and time. That's most of all we need time. And as, you, as you've seen, four months um, isn't quite adequate time yet. So this is a tough spot because when you're going through all the changes, the addict is always a little bit um, 
antsy to have the, the partner recognize all the good stuff they're doing. And it just often is slow to come. I think I would just stay the course, right? That's all you can do. You keep doing what you're doing. Um, you, I would actually encourage you if you're not uh, to do daily check-ins, make sure your communication with your spouse is really good. And the check-ins don't have to be long. They can be even just 10 minutes. The Thanos check-in is a little too short, I think, or two or three minutes. I like a little more elaboration, but but you know, talk for 10 minutes, check in each day. And I think talk about um, your process, uh, if you're comfortable with that, like what, what you've learned about yourself, what, what you're working on um, to the extent you're comfortable with. And, and, and again, not to make her responsible for it, not to make her the policeman in your recovery, but, but to share. And I think that even though you may not you know, be, be uh, done yet or cooked or whatever to use a cooking metaphor, um, you're, it, it's evidence that you're working. And I think that's what she's looking for, just some difference in behavior. And we know that that reassurance for betrayal trauma takes time, but also takes consistent behavior change over time, right? That integrity of, of doing what you say, saying what you do, and just repeating it over and over again with in, in, uh, integrity. So I think just keep doing it. Um, but I would really make sure you're communicating adequately with your wife. I, I, it, you can't, I wouldn't engage in arguing, you know, if she's angry. Um, I, th I would take, obviously you're probably gonna be frustrated, frustrated. I would take that frustration and if you need to express it, express it to your peer group, express it to your sponsor, express it to your therapist, take it outside. It's not gonna be helpful in the relationship to express that. Um, now I will say, um, I don't, sometimes it can cross a line, use the word abusive behavior, I think. Um, and nobody, abuse is never okay, right? And we have had spouses who um, just became really kind of abusive in the feedback they were giving to the addict. And I think that does cross the line. You know, are you, is the, the spouse has every right to, to express anger and hurt and all that, those feelings, and, and for a long time, because they're going to take a while to, to work their way through. But um, I think it always has to be a respectful process. And that comes down to boundaries. You know, we always are very careful to include the spouse on what their boundaries are. And I think also if you have a right to your own safety, right? A right not to be abused verbally and a right not to um, to be abused, period. And so I think that may be a boundary issue that you have to set and it may be best set or dis discussed in the context of a therapeutic session, either with you and your CSAT or her and her CSAT and the two of you are a couples therapist. Some, but I think that discussion where you're talking about this because it is so sensitive should be done in the context of the therapist that kind of guide the discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, the cure for this is for you to be rigorously honest about everything all the time for at least a year. <laughs> um, because if you can do that, she will start to trust you. It's usually about the one year mark. Um, if you can stay sober and also be rigorously honest in all aspects of life, if she can see you doing that, not just with her, but with everyone, um, she'll come around. But it, it's going to be a year, um, sometimes longer. Um, but we also have to remember as addicts, we've known about our behavior from day one. Our partners, they get hit with the Mack truck. Um, and boom, um, it's, it's you know, the, the emotional equivalent of, you know, Armageddon all at once. And she may still be adjusting to the new reality, um, which is that, you know, you cheated on her with pornography and, and maybe other things, and she, she's probably still angry. Um, and it may take a while to process through that. Some, some spouses do it quickly. Some spouses, some spouses need a lot of time. Um, yeah. So, um, hello, Dr. Fawcett. Can you talk about dopamine fasting and the science behind it? Um, I'm not familiar with dopamine fasting per se, so I really can't speak to the science behind it. I think I imagine that sounds like just de depriving yourself of dopamine for a while. I guess that would be. Um, you know, I, I honestly I don't know the science behind that. Uh, I so I really can't comment on it. it um, I, I do know that we need, just as human beings, we need dopamine, right? We need dopamine to function. And um, so I'm a little cautious about that kind of um, fasting. We, uh, as addicts, sometimes recovery can get into 
what's sometimes described as kind of anorexic behavior, right? People become asexual, people stop other kinds of things. Um, dopamine has a very specific role. Dopamine is not the enemy here. Dopamine is, is a very important neurotransmitter that, that keeps us stable, keeps us functioning, keeps us happy. And by the way, just not psychologically, it, um, Parkinson's, for example, is a dopamine disorder. And you know, that's when people don't have adequate um, dopamine in certain motor cells. And that's another function of dopamine is that motor, motor cell uh, activity and control. So you're messing with a whole bunch of different body systems when you do that. Um, and, but that's just off the top of my head. I don't, don't really know the data or the science on that. I would just be really careful about it because in theory, it sounds like a good idea. We have too much dopamine, let's fast, like we do for kinds of food, but, but I think it could have more serious consequences if we're not careful. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Well, the way I was reading this was so many addicts new to recovery feel like I shouldn't have any fun. I don't deserve to because, you know, I've done all these bad things. Uh, um, and then if they're like, you know, I, I David mentioned anhedonia er, earlier. Um, I was definitely dealing with anhedonia in early recovery. So it was hard for me to have fun with anything. And I didn't think I deserved to. Um, and both my therapist and the people around me in recovery were adamant about, you know, you you need to give yourself some little pleasures every day. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to become more and more depressed. So, you know, there was the occasional ice cream and, you know, the occasional movie. And even if I struggled to enjoy those things the way I was later able to after my, my brain adjusted, um, I still needed that pleasure to remind myself that the world is not like this dull gray right. um so denying yourself any kind of fun in early recovery i think is a bad idea i think the opposite is a good idea um we need to have some fun do you, do you agree with that david i too I, yes totally and i, and I think um i was going to add the, to what you said that oftentimes in in early recovery we're kind of as addicts we're so kind of guilty and full of shame and remorse and that we, like you just said, we really don't believe we deserve happiness or fun or anything. We need to, we need to suffer, right? And, and I think, and certainly we need to be responsible. We need to feel the pain that we've caused people we love and, and, and all that. But I also think that it's okay to laugh, to have fun. I, I remember when I first, one of my first AA meetings, I forget if it was the first, very first day or not, but it was one of those typical meetings where you walk in and people are laughing. Somebody did something really funny and it was like this uproarious laughter. And I was really offended by some, this is serious stuff. You know, why are these people laughing? But I, it was a good lesson for me because I realized, yeah, we do need to laugh. Um, and we also need to take this serious, a deadly disease. We need to take it very serious, but but mixed in with the, um, the humility and the serious application of our, our recovery work we need to be able to have fun. We deserve to have fun. I think that's something that is really hard to accept maybe in early recovery, but I think that's an important message. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you please talk about emotional sobriety in relationships? My wife has pointed out that my relationships with female coworkers are inappropriate for a sex addict. I'm not sexually inappropriate, but I do like to make myself their go-to guy or the hero that solves their problems. Um, I think I'm seeking a hit or affirmation from them uh, that I should be getting from my wife. We'll address that little tag on <laughs> at some point here. Um, so apart from being aware, um, are there any tools or resources to change this behavior I have? Right. So, yeah, you've hit on something really important and that a lot of sex addicts, particularly, I think, um, seek validation in ways and they seek validation from women. I'm always amused that somebody say, well, I'm just a, a jovial guy. I like to talk to people, but well, 99% of the people you talk to are women. So, you know, there's a little bit of a selective bias there, but, but I think what happens here is that um, there's a core issue of needing to be like, you even use the word needing to be a hero. Uh, and so these are, yeah, this is how we gain approval. This is how we gain validation. And I think really the flip side of it, these are reflections of not feeling very worthy or feeling like we have to go work a little harder to get that validation that we need. Validation is a dopamine hit. Validation is, is a little bit of a feel-good 
bump, right? And so um, I'd really be aware of when you're doing it, how you're doing it, and mostly who you're doing it with, because it's one thing to be a nice guy. It's one thing to be, you know, helpful at work. But if you're kind of selectively identifying females to uh, foster these relationships with, then yeah, you're you're in dangerous territory there. So I think uh, it's a good observation. I think you'd have to really look at how you function in the workplace, how you get that validation. First of all, I'd, with your therapist, I dig down what is that validation thing all about? You know, what are your core beliefs in there? Is it that you're not worthy, or you're unlovable, or you just, you know, what? What is, I think probably there's some negative core beliefs at work that you're trying to correct with the validation seeking. But but then you've got to really just take some practical steps and boundaries in terms of how do you get how do you get handle this right and some and there's many solutions some some guys you know I see the door open at work for example some guys uh, make a point of not um, going to business trips or traveling with female colleagues you know that there's all kinds of kind of rules and boundaries that you can put in and, and it's almost case by case but I think the awareness is as you found out is really good but I think we also have to be really careful about um, and I, I was having this discussion today with the clients. Sometimes we think, okay, we have this acting out behavior. That's the egregious stuff that you know gets discovered and it causes pain. It's horrible, and we, we realize we're addicts. But we stop that behavior. But then there's these other kinds of behaviors that are kind of half half addict behaviors that we have to really be careful of. That I think can lead us back to our primary addiction if we're not careful. They can cause a major relapse if we're not careful. And those are things like. You know, getting the little dopamine trail, looking at Instagram or Facebook at the kind of the not porn or those kind of things. Um, when you're out in crowds, lingering a little bit too long on on people that you're you know find appealing, uh, and things like this, seeking validation from in situations where you can like legally, um, without raising an eyebrow, interact with with females, but you're kind of overdoing it. You know, so I think setting boundaries and really monitoring them and, and getting good feedback and then really digging in why what's what's going on what's the payoff and why do you need to do that and when you stop doing that you may have a better understanding of that um, but anyway yeah, i think it's a it's an issue scott did you have more to add on that oh god yes <laughs> <laughs> um this this hero thing um the hero complex so many sex addicts want to be the hero i mean guys who you know, give the stripper a $500 tip because, you know, she's in school and they want to help her better herself. And no, what they want is for her to fall in love and so they can have great sex uh, with, with the stripper. I, I mean, but, you know, the hit of being a hero is a hit of you like me, you like me. Well, you know, that's part of the addiction. Um, you know, I had a sponsee for, this is quite a while ago, um, who was a medical doctor, and we would go out to dinner fairly often, because uh, we both like to go out to dinner, and we do our 12-step our stuff, and every time we had a waitress, he, he would, you know, oh, what's your name, <coughs> you know, <coughs> are you also in school, you know, what's your, you know, blah, blah, all these questions, flirting. Um, if we had a waiter, my sponsee would place his order <laughs> and I pointed out to him and he's like I'm just gregarious I'm just being a nice guy I'm like last week we had a waiter and you gave him your order and that was it <laughs> and um you know there's this you know nice guy hero solve problems um it's part of the it is an active part of the addiction um and it is part of the acting out so I'm glad you're aware of it um so I, I wanted to I wanted to make it very clear that this is active addiction for you, um, and you are getting a hit for, off of it. Um, and then what I wanted to address, you wrote, I think I'm seeing a, seeking a hit from them that I should be getting from my wife, or I think I'm seeking a hit of affirmation from them that I should be getting from my wife. When I initially read that, I thought, oh my God, that's so blaming. Uh, my wife doesn't affirm me, so I get it from the ladies at work. Um, as I read it again, I think I my, my initial interpretation was wrong. Um, and you're just realizing that if you're going to be a hero, you should be a hero for your wife, not the ladies at work. Um, so anyway, uh, so but but when I first read it, I thought, oh boy, if you said that to your wife, she might get really mad at you. Um, 
so yeah, any any uh, th that's what I had to add, David. Yeah, that's that's great. I, I love the part. Of, it is active addiction. I think that's really important to, to mention. But yeah, you know, right as such, it's not like egregious acting out. But boy, it's it's bad stuff, and it'll lead to the to the acting out if we're not careful. The other acting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, Dr. Fawcett. Can you talk about semen retention and sexual transmutation? Is there any science behind it? Um, semen uh, retention and sexual transmutation. Um, new, new terms for me. <laughs> yeah, so semen retention, um, basically the idea of you know not ejaculating, withholding semen, um, I think, you know, quite a few times when we talk about the the, uh, the uh, abstinence contract of people or recommend periods of sexual abstinence, people kind of freak out saying, you know, I have to um, ejaculate or I'll die, basically, I think is the core belief. Um, you know, that's not true, obviously. People go a long time, go the whole lives without ejaculating and they'll be okay. Um, seam retention is a way of, I think, building up uh, and I don't know if there's much science behind it, honestly, but it's the idea of building up, I think, sexual energy and sexual um, power and kind of building it up in a way that um, can be expressed then over time uh, more accordingly. Um, I think I, I'm more interested almost in the, the sexual transmutation. And well, if I understand it correctly, that's kind of taking our sexual energy and using that transforming it to to um to fuel other behaviors right to kind of it's almost taking that sexual drive and converting it into you know getting jobs done in work or in our creative life or something like that um i've known people that have tried that i think where we get in trouble with that when we're talking about addiction is that um it's real easy to confuse the energy of sexually transmuted energy, if you will, with with that energy, with the addictive drive, right? The the compulsion, and I think when we're talking about those kind of energies, which are basically just drives that are that are created by hormones and and chemicals in our bodies, it's really hard to distinguish sometimes. And I think it's very tricky because we can have that addictive compulsion that's actually a drive toward kind of self-destructive addictive behavior that can feel like some of these other energies, if you will. Um, so I, I don't, I, I'm not an expert on either of these things. So um, those are just kind of my, my gut responses. I, I, I think it's hard enough sometimes to kind of reawaken healthy sexual energy and healthy intimacy in recovery for sex addicts and porn addicts and any addict for that matter. So I think it's kind of tricky to um, to play with that energy. I think sometimes just trying to get it back on track in a healthy way that's not um, dependent on addiction or high fantasy elements or and, and is more directed and in, in, in emotionally um, fulfilling way with with intimacy. I think there's just better ways to do it, frankly. Um, and I think because I don't know that much, I think I'll stop there. But um, I, I think there are better ways for the addict to move into healthy sex and intimacy and recovery besides yeah. some of these techniques. David, when we get questions about things like dopamine fasting and semen retention and sexual transmutation, um, I always want to scream, you're overthinking. <laughs> you know, sobriety is kind of simple. You know, you figure out what your problem behaviors are and you stay away from them. <laughs> and and, you know, let's get some sobriety under our belt before we start exploring, you know, semen retention. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it almost is like you're looking for a way around actually addressing the issues that underlie addiction. Um, does, does that strike you that way too, too, David, or am I off base here? No, I, I think when I have a client in my office who, who does this, it's a little bit of a, a shiny object off to one side in a way that kind of diverts the discussion away from the basics. And, you know, it's fine to talk about that stuff, but as long as we talk about the basics too, but I think, I think uh, people can get hijacked by those concepts and, and forget um, what it's like to kind of get back to a healthy sense. I think most addicts certainly don't know what is a healthy sex drive, you know, that they, they don't know how it feels. And so if you're messing around with, 
you know, semen retention or sexual transmutation, you're messing with those feelings anyway, and it's confusing. And I think the chances of getting it wrong are really great. So I think just to allow that um, healthy sex and intimacy uh, to, to start to form in a way that is complicated enough in recovery without overcomplicating or overthinking it. So I agree totally. Yeah, it's, I mean, I always, I think about fad diets, which often work for a short period of time, but not long-term. Um, you know, if you want to lose weight long-term, eat a balanced diet and exercise. It's pretty simple. <laughs> eat a balanced diet and exercise. And the same is with recovery. If you want long-term recovery, stop engaging in the problem behaviors and work on your underlying trauma. Then play with all the other concepts uh, if you want. But yeah, so anyway, um, since sports are adrenaline producing activities, would you say they are also intensity seeking activities? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so when we talk about sensation seekers, you know, what do, what do we see in terms of sports? We see, you know, parachuting, bungee jumping, um, ski racing, uh, car racing, there's, uh, anything, rock climbing, um, anything kind of thrilling and sensation seeking. And so, yes, I mean, totally. People um, are kind of wired that way. And it's, and But what are they wired to? They're wired to the dopamine hit, right? It, it can become an addictive kind of behavior and a very dangerous one too, because like in any addiction, there's tolerance and escalation. So maybe this, maybe I've, you know, skied on these kind of unmarked, unpatrolled back mountain things and you know it's been thrilling but maybe next time you need to up the ante somehow just like an addict ups the ante we maybe move into different kinds of kink behaviors or we escalate somehow a little more taboo stuff and that happens with with sensation seeing behaviors too people take more risk and more risk and more risk and so it becomes ultimately extremely risky so yeah and, and then the danger is of course that can lead back into other kinds of intensity addictive behaviors so as I said at the beginning, what's the solution? I think to, I think it's um, unsustainable to just say don't do that anymore because those people, as we've found in research, are basically wired that way biologically. Their brains react to these things differently. But uh, if you're a sensation seeker and you're drawn to those kind of sports or activities, it's really on you to figure out okay, how can I do this in a healthy way where it's not going to kind of take control of me. Or it's not going to lead back into my addictive behavior because they're the the chemical profile of what you do when you're looking at porn or sexual acting out versus bungee jumping they're almost the same in your brain right and so it's really easy to kind of switch from one to the other and so just just be cautious about that with team sports though part of my early recovery you know i was encouraged to you know join some teams um and it's not all about the intensity. Yeah, we get the dopamine and the adrenaline when you're playing basketball or, or whatever. But um, there's also a bonding element. The other neurochemicals are there. Gotcha. It's very different when you're bonding at the same time you're engaging in these, these activities, which goes back to what David said earlier. If you want to jump out of a plane, get a big group, you know, <laughs> do it all together you know, get some of the other neurochemicals flowing so it doesn't feel so much like straight up addiction. Um, and, and when I've talked to people that have done that, it's a much better experience because not only do they get the, the rush and the dopamine of whatever the intense activity was, but they get the camaraderie, they get the fellowship, they get the shared experience, they get the fun, you know, it's just yeah. fun to do that with people. So yeah, it's a whole, it's a much more three-dimensional experience. Yeah, you get to hang out afterward and rehash yeah. it laugh and make fun of each other and it's it's a much healthier experience um next question here um sensation seeking sounds kind of like adhd always looking for stimulation um, and sensation seeking along with self-control um could it be because addiction and adhd have lower dopamine <coughs> excuse me lower dopamine um uh, david are addiction and adhd related or Right. So yes, they are. There, there's a, a lot of co-occurring um, ADHD with addiction, especially the intensity addictions. As this person kind of intuitively pointed out, there's a lot of overlap, both in how it looks and the behaviors and the sensations. 
we find in the literature about 30% uh, of sex addicts also meet the criteria for ADHD. Um, now, ADHD is a, a complicated diagnosis. Uh, it's a legitimate diagnosis, uh, although it's, I think it's overused. And I think the medications for ADHD, the amphetamines, are overprescribed. And I know they're, they're abused by a lot of people once they are prescribed. So I think there's a, there's a big kind of red flag area here to watch. Uh, now, if you're ADHD, legitimately, you need to probably have um, some treatment for it. And the best treatment often is not only medication, but some kind of therapy and behavioral uh, skills as well. The medications, though, as we know, are amphetamines, typically, not all of them. And that's really tricky for uh, an addict, especially an amphetamine addict, to be sticking more amphetamines in their body every day, trying to stay sober. So I recommend if, you're on, if you truly have ADHD, uh, to look maybe for a non-amphetamine medication like Stratera, for example, there are several uh, that, that treat ADHD. They work a little slower uh, and you don't get the kick that you do from the amphetamines, which a lot of people like. Um, but anyway, it is a big problem. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a big problem. And so we have to really watch that with addiction because it, it leads right into the intensity addictions for sure. Thank you. Um... My sex addict husband has used pot to manage difficult emotions for almost 10 years. There have been periods of daily use and use at work. He has exhibited addiction-like behaviors, uh, such as gaslighting, blaming, lying, minimizing, et cetera, with pot similar to porn. Um, he claims his pot use is not an addiction. I haven't really seen much about pot as a companion to porn. Is this rare? Is it possible that he can have a sex addiction and a pot habit that's not an addiction. Okay, well, when you describe his use over that period of time. That's addiction. <laughs> decade, <laughs> a decade to control feelings. Uh, yeah, I'd say there's an issue there. Um, so cannabis is a really interesting thing because um, it's becoming legalized a lot of places. The, there's been studies that show basically the, the public's notion of the dangerousness of cannabis is reduced and that is most impactful in adolescence and and for the most part cannabis from an adult point of view not speaking of an addict but just in general cannabis is, is far less harmful than other drugs except for an adolescent for an adolescent cannabis is really devastating for the for the developing brain and that's really it's upsetting to me that adolescents are also hearing the messages that oh cannabis what's the big deal it's legal it's not dangerous but it is dangerous for, for the developing brain. So um, that aside, um, this case, yeah, cannabis is a very effective way to control moods, to numb moods, to check out. Cannabis can fuel fantasy, cannabis numbs. I mean, it's, it's a totally powerful addictive drug. And the way you describe your husband using it to manage feelings, to manage stress and so on, uh, is totally, uh, that's like classic addict behavior. Um, now, I always encourage our clients to look at how different drugs merge in terms of their sex addiction ritual, right? And we often find, even though they don't identify um, as a drug addict, we often find that, that two drugs appear frequently in the beginning of the addictive cycle, alcohol and cannabis. And because what do they do? They disinhibit, they relax, they do the kind of headspace, and they set the stage for all the other behavior that follows. But, but cannabis on its own right is a very powerful drug that does uh, numb and do all that. So all that said, I think um, your husband really needs to address that drug use and, and, uh, and take that into account because that, that's a very effective way to keep all those feelings at bay. And I suspect when he gives it up, there's a lot of stuff that's gonna come bubbling up that's been buried for years and years and years. So yeah, please, please, please address that because that's a, that's a big problem. You cannot get sober from one addiction if there's another act of addiction smoldering somewhere else, right? It's just, it just doesn't work. So it's really important that he address that. Yeah, I'm 100% in agreement. Using a substance or a behavior to regulate your emotions is a hallmark of addiction. Um, all addictions... Uh, every kind of addiction is what we call a maladaptive coping mechanism. Right. It's what we do when we don't want to feel something. Uh, you know, I'm anxious or I'm lonely or I'm bored, so I smoke dope or I look at porn. 
or a drink or, and you know, most of you, if you've been here a while, you know, I'm, I'm not just a sex and porn addict, I'm also an alcoholic and drug addict and my drug, drug of choice was marijuana. Um, and boy, I did not want to give it up when I got sober. As a matter of fact, I kept it secret from my therapist for quite a while. Um, uh, and eventually I realized, you know, I'm not getting any better. Um, and yeah. I think I'm not getting any better because I'm still an active addict. Um, I had just limited it to just one substance. Um, and the pull of that substance is still very strong. Uh, several years ago, we legalized uh, marijuana in California. And my immediate thought after like 15 years away from it was, oh, I can get high again. It's legal. And then I had to remember, oh, I didn't quit it because it was illegal. I quit it because it was destroying my life. Um, and, and, you know, and I was still gaslighting and blaming and lying and minimizing all of the harm. Everything you describe is just, it's like, well, his pot use is addictive and he needs to deal with it. I'm 100% in with David on that. Yeah. Um, what is big T trauma versus little t trauma? How does little t trauma lead to addiction and how can it be treated? Great question. Great question. So um, I believe it started with EMDR, which is one of the trauma main trauma modalities of therapies. They drew a distinction between these two kinds of traumatic experiences. And they did it because when people think about trauma, classically, you know, we think about a terrible car accident or a war injury in Afghanistan or Iraq or um, some natural disaster or a tidal wave, you know, those are certainly traumas. And a trauma by definition is where you believe you're going to die. Um, and there's other kinds of danger and things that follow. So those are certainly life-threatening experiences. What we found by looking at people who were actually truly traumatized, but didn't have any of those things, but they had other kinds of traumas that we realized were not like the big, what they call the capital T traumas, you know, those major, major disasters, but, but other maybe less intense, lower grade, and sometimes chronic behaviors. So for example, the, the one um, behavior I often cite uh, is bullying. And, you know, bullying seems like, oh, everybody gets bullied. It's part of, you know, the ritual of growing up. But for certain individuals, and some are, who are, of whom are bullied, you know, mercilessly, bullying over time chronically would be considered trauma with a lowercase t, which can lead to trauma. And then the second part of your question is, what is, how can it lead to trauma? The, the way, uh, sorry, lead to, uh, to a trauma than addiction. The way bullying or other kinds of behaviors like that or incidents lead is that we, uh, it's in terms of the reaction, the, the key is how we react, how we cope with it. When, when we experience trauma, the experience basically overwhelms our brain's ability to process that experience and to strip away the emotional content from the memory itself. And normally when we have an experience, our brain takes things apart, plugs some things, and one part of the brain plugs some things in other, it remembers the emotion connected, it remembers the incident. But when we have trauma, that system, it kind of gets stuck in that system. And so when we think about the trauma or we are reminded of the trauma, we re-experience all the emotions that go with it. And so trauma therapy actually helps us, helps the brain, because the brain actually does the work, process the, the, the experience so it goes away. We don't forget about it, but we hopefully after trauma therapy, we can remember the event, but not have the, the emotional reaction as if we're reliving it right at that moment. So, so those processes are, are what lead to trauma. It's our, our brain's ability basically to un, unable to handle it. And it's our inability to kind of cope with stuff. And so that, it gets kind of stuck and if there's a lot of work that needs to be uh, processed and undone in trauma therapy. So we know from what's called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, a major study that looks at how these different experiences that can drum in it, it includes the major T stuff, but also, you know, which would be like sexual assault, physical assault, all that, but it also includes things like neglect. You know, neglect would be another lower case T. Neglect meaning not that I didn't have clothes or, or you know, a roof over my head or food, but neglect in terms of what we call emotional attunement. My parents never told me they loved me. My parents never came to a game. My parents never took an interest in what I was doing. You know, my, my parents never bothered to make an emotional attachment to me. That is neglect. And that can lead to trauma as well. And so there's many roads to trauma. Um, and fortunately, the good news is that there's many great, great therapies now for trauma as well. 
there's no reason for anybody to really be suffering with trauma. There's just too many good, good ways to deal with it. Scott, you're muted, I think. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I notice, I mostly deal with addicts and, and men, and, um, and when they're looking back, um, you know, the big T traumas, they tend to deal with them. Um, they'll talk about a big T, they'll talk about a car accident, they'll talk about my mom died, they'll talk about, you know, that stuff. Little T traumas, they stuff it, and it just festers. Um, and and it, it becomes big T trauma, um, because it's never dealt with. David, do you see that as well? And is that just a male thing? Or do women do that too? Um, um, yeah, I think it is certainly a universal thing where, you know, we sort of deal with the major stuff and tend to attribute all our problems to that one event and kind of ignore the other stuff around it. So we tend to ignore the, the, the little T things like you mentioned. Um, I think men just by acculturation and wiring tend to stuff things more than women in general. That's a real generalization, I know. Um, women, I think, are more, uh, I think women tend to maybe more be more processing. They talk about stuff more, maybe with their girlfriends or with each other, or they're they're more prone to discuss it and and talk about it. I think men don't want to talk about it. They just kind of stuff it or shove it down, down deep where it's not going to be discovered or felt for sure. Yeah. Um, let's take one more here real quick. Um, my sex addict porn addict husband admits that he's an addict and he continues to make excuses as to why he cannot seek recovery or treatment. Um, this addiction has destroyed our marriage, our family, our finances, some of his friendships, as well as one of his previous jobs. If this were any other type of addiction, he would be in need of an intervention. Why don't I ever hear about interventions for sex addiction? Um, we want to have a young, we have a young child and I want to feel as though I've tried everything before seeking divorce. David, are there interventions for sex addicts? Um, yes, and there are interventions for sex addicts. I mean, we think of the classic interventionists as working with substance abuse, but uh, there are people that do that kind of work as well for, for sex addiction settings. It's, you're absolutely right. The, the writer of this question, it's, it's a serious problem and it responds well to intervention, just like any other addiction. Uh, people are in denial. People don't understand the impact they've had. And sometimes um, it takes an organized effort to kind of, you know, virtually shape the person to, to make them kind of, kind of wake up, you know, see, see the issue. So yeah, there are, there are specialists called interventionists. Uh, some therapists do it as well. Um, so yeah, those things, I, I would encourage you to speak to your therapist or CSAT if you have one, to talk about how that might work. Yeah, and if um, you want help finding somebody to help you with this, um, drop us an email, click the contact us button. Um, those emails go directly to Tammy, say, hey, I need an interventionist for sex addiction. Um, she will either give you a CSAT in your area who can do an intervention or will find an interventionist for you in your area who's good. Um, yeah, just because this is sex addiction doesn't mean you can't have an intervention. Um, he's not going to like it either way. <laughs> People don't like being intervened on, um, but I, I like that you care enough to say, you know, before I file for divorce, we, you know, I want to make one more real effort. Um, so yeah, good for you. Um, we've got a couple questions left. We don't have any time left, so I'm going to save these and we're going to roll them over to next week. Um, and we'll, I promise we'll do these first right out of the gate. Um, David, anything you want to say to take us out? Um, yeah, just just to say I'm sorry for the technological glitches tonight, but we'll make sure we have a trend workout just next week for sure. So, yeah, that's it. We got you here. So that's what counts. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the great questions today. Um, yeah. We will see you next week. Same time, same place. All right. Take care. Good Bye -bye. evening.